Um, so welcome everybody. This is Alicia Carriquiri um, at Iowa State University. I'm the director of CSAVE. And it's kind of funny to talk out there. We don't know who's watching. I can see a few people here on the screen. But um, thank you for joining us today. Um, this is one of our uh, first, not the first, but one of our first uh, CSAVE wide webinars. And we have Hal Stern from uh, our partner institution, the University of California at Irvine, who's going to be talking about likelihood ratios. Um, before I pass the uh, control to him, let me see if I can move, I'd like to make a couple of announcements. Um, we have a couple of upcoming events. Uh, we will have another center-wide webinar uh, coming up on February 10 at 11 a.m. Central uh, CST. Uh, this is going to be on shoe prints, and our speaker this time is, go is going to be uh, Adam Kortilewski, uh, who is uh, from uh, Switzerland and is going to be visiting both NIST and after NIST uh, Iowa State, CSAVE. Uh, and finally, uh, we will have an all hands meeting here in Iowa State uh, on June 7, 8, and 9. Uh, there's been some announcements that were sent out already, but there will be much more. And uh, we hope that you can all join us here for um, a good event, we hope. Um, as always, uh, thank you to NIST, our sponsor and um, our partner. Uh, I'm not going to say partner in crime, that would be too much of a fun, but <laughs> in solving crime. Uh, so, uh, we're without further ado, I think I'm going to launch and let Hal take it away. Hi, are you ready, Hal? Hope so. I'm ready. I don't know how to do this. Oh, got there. I'm trying. Oh, with the mouse. Never mind. All right, there you go. Okay. <coughs> All right, so I'm taking control, and hopefully you can see my PowerPoint. Okay. Uh, someone, maybe Iowa State, confirm that you can see my PowerPoint and hear me. Yes. Okay, great. Uh, so this is Hal Stern. I am a statistician at the University of California, Irvine. Uh, I have about eight to ten people in a room here, so... I have some people that I can actually look at. Uh, I typically like to walk around while I talk, but not this time. So uh, welcome from not quite as sunny as usual California, uh, a little bit of a rainy period. Um, I offered to give a talk about likelihood ratios. Uh, it's pretty broad. Uh, most of it is not mine. Um, that is, I'm reporting on other things, but uh, Likely ratios are getting a lot of attention and, and I thought it would be of some value and I hope that you find it so. Uh, one of the things I have discovered is I don't see any pictures of any people. So um, if you want to ask a question, feel free to clarify whatever. Uh, unmute yourself, probably say question, and then I'll recognize you. Sorry, but that's the only way I can think of to do this. Um, I hope to finish early enough so that we can have some back and forth at the end, you know, five or ten minutes or so. So with that said, here we go. Uh, we're talking about pattern evidence. Um, that's the remit of CSAFE. And so most of you or all of you are presumably familiar with that. I have here a uh, latent fingerprint next to a uh, known print, a uh, known shoe and a crime scene impression, and two um, breach faces. Um, and so these are the kinds of comparisons that people want to make. Uh, I'm talking about likely ratios today. And likely ratios are not just about pattern evidence. In fact, one of the things I'm going to say is it's not immediately clear how quickly they will be available for pattern evidence, but they are relevant for other types of evidence, for example, broken glass and some of the characteristics that you can measure, um, or DNA. So as I tell the story about likely ratio, I will include each of these types of evidence types. A little background first. Uh, the broad framework for what we want to do in forensics is to assess evidence from a crime scene and then from a suspect typically. And so 
as the previous couple of slides showed, a couple of slides ago showed, um, you might have a latent print or a fraction of a print at a crime scene, and then you have a suspect, so you have their full 10 fingerprints to work from, and you want to determine if they are in fact the source of that latent print. Uh, or for other, similar for other types of evidence. This work is done by forensic examiners, and they operate, the courts operate under what's known as the federal courts operate under the Daubert standard, and many states do as well. And these set the judge as the determiner of what expert testimony is allowed, and requires expert testimony be based on scientific knowledge, and that scientific knowledge, it says, comes from scientific methods. And so one has to judge whether scientific method has been used to support the testimony. And it lists a number of factors that a judge should keep take into account. None of these are, quote unquote, required, but these are the kinds of things that would indicate to a judge that this is a scientific method that should be allowed. And they include things like, is the method appear in a peer-reviewed literature? Are there documented error rates for it? The most common ways that forensic science examiners go about this um, are really two ways. Um, the first I would label just quote unquote expert assessment based on experience. Uh, examiners may describe it differently, but this is in fact really what happens in the pattern disciplines at the moment. And so I'll say a little bit more as we go on about some of the specific disciplines, but in broad strokes, someone who does this a lot um, will, in the case of latent prints, uh, identify features on the latent print. Um, and then I'll actually go back a few slides and you can see them. Um, the red circles on here are features, places where ridges come together or ridges end, um, and they are identified on the latent print and then on the comparator print, and if there's enough matching and nothing non-matching that is enough to dissuade the examiner, the examiner will draw a conclusion that this person was the source of the print. So that's pretty much standard practice in the disciplines I list here. There are statistical approaches that have been developed and are being developed. Um, at the moment, there are two, from my way of thinking about it, standard ways that this is done. One is uh, some kind of traditional statistical hypothesis test. That currently happens in glass or can happen in glass. Uh, in glass, the scenario is there are glass fragments at the scene of a crime, uh, from a broken window at the scene of a crime, and then you find a suspect and they will have fragments, small fragments on, on their person. And the question is, are those two sets of fragments coming from the same window, which would implicate the person as being a potential uh, criminal? And so that is done using a traditional test where some characteristic, the refractive index I'll talk about a little later, is measured on each fragment and you have two samples of refractive indices and you ask if they have the same mean. And if you reject that hypothesis, the person is probably not the, sort, the, person, is not, probably not the person who is there to break the window. Um, the more complicated issue then is if they do agree, it just means the glass is consistent. You haven't placed the person there, but the glass is consistent. So it's a limitation of just based on, basing on a testing approach. And then the subject I want to talk about today is likely ratios, which are used in DNA and of great interest in other disciplines. So there's work going on in other disciplines to try and apply that. Uh, a little bit more in terms of background, uh, CSAFE itself is the product of a number of events that have led to a desire to improve forensic science and to strengthen the scientific base for forensic science. So I list several of the contributing factors here. Um, you know, one of the things that happened in the mid 80s is as DNA technology developed, not for forensics, for general science, um, it was recognized and a couple of National Academy of Science panels studied its potential uses and um, how, how it could be used in this context. Um, and so DNA was the first place where people began to quantify evidence using a likelihood ratio. And I remember, and Alicia will remember, 15, 18 years ago, we were approached by the FBI, the uh, folks at the FBI while I was at Iowa State, and they basically said, we recognize that with DNA, the standard is going up. 
people are going to want us to be able to do this in other domains. And we did a project about bullet lead that I'll refer to shortly, uh, briefly in, in some of the following. Um, so that's one factor. Uh, second factor is the work of the Innocence Project, which started in 1992 uh, by Barry Sheck and Peter Neufeld. Um, and they have been going over cases and uh, finding instances in which people were wrongly convicted. Uh, and then a few other events I've listed here, a, mis a mistaken latent print identification, fairly famous one, uh, the NRC report, which I think most people are familiar with, and most recently the PCAST report. A few words on some of these. Uh, on the Innocence Project, uh, as I mentioned, started in 1992, and by now more than 340 people have gotten out of prison based on work done by the Innocence Project, and typically what happens is DNA evidence that was not analyzed at the time is analyzed and proves conclusively that the person could not have done the crime. Uh, when they have these exonerations, they have categorized what caused the mistaken conviction. And um, as for the two cases I have on the slide, um, eyewitness identification is a big, big problem. Um, that is very often one of the causes for the conviction. But improper or unvalidated forensic science also turns out to be a factor in about half of their exonerations or so. So I mentioned the misidentification of fingerprint. Um, not going to spend a lot of time on this, but uh, fingerprint examiners you know, certainly as recently as 15 or 20 years ago, and I think even more recently, would basically testify that the method they used had a zero error rate. Um, and that, of course, you know, was never really true, um, but there was a very high profile error, which is um, outlined here. And uh, what's really striking here is the print on the left, and this comes from a report of the Office of the Inspector General of the Department of Justice. The print on the left here, figure 6A, is uh, the latent print that was recovered from a plastic bag containing detonators that was recovered in Spain. The middle print here is a print from Brandon Mayfield, uh, an attorney in Oregon. And the numbered marks there, which the resolution is not really well enough to see, um, are features in common. So that's 10 features in common. And then the feature on the right, where they're not numbered, unfortunately, I just took this from the Inspector General report, um, is the person who they actually believe was the source of the fingerprint. Um, uh, and you can see how similar they are. Um, and so there's a lot, I mean, there's a 150 or 200 page Inspector General's report of how this happened. But the very fact of it happening had consequences because the FBI lab is really very, very strong and outstanding in what they do. And if they could make an error of this type, obviously it, it could happen elsewhere. Um, so one consequence of this, I was part of an expert working group that looked at ways to minimize human error that came up in fingerprint analyses, human factors. Uh, I'll say less about these. I think they're much more well known. Uh, the National Research Council report was based on a congressional request and Congress budgeted for it. Uh, Karen Cafedar, another CSAFE principal from the University of Virginia, was on this Academy panel that created this report. And they did a very broad deep dive into forensics had a large number of recommendations. Uh, but for our purposes, a key thing was they joined a chorus of identifying a lack of scientific basis for some of the conclusions that were being drawn. And the most recent entry is a PCAST report, the President's Council of Advisors on Science and Technology um, under President Obama uh, was asked, is there more we should be doing? Kind of about forensics. Um, and so they um, reviewed the literature. They heard from a lot of people, including uh, several CSAFE people. Um, and they, in broad strokes, basically said, if we want to use a method, we need to make sure that it has foundational validity. Um, that is, that it can do the job that it's supposed to do. And validity has applied that in the specific case, it was applied correctly and validly. 
Um, and what they meant by foundational validity was um, that some kind of empirical testing to establish that the method is reproducible, reliable, and validity. And then they looked at a number of disciplines, and I've listed five here, or six by their count. Um, they looked at DNA, single source and simple, simple mixture on one hand, and complex mixture on the other as two different methods. Um, and they concluded DNA, single source or simple mixture, satisfies foundational validity. There have been enough studies that demonstrate that this works. And Leighton Prince has, since the time of the mistake, had a number of studies and has foundational validity. Um, Leighton Prince has an error rate. It's not perfect, but... Um, okay. So there's a chat, and I don't know what that means. Does that mean people have questions? Are the slides going to be available? Yes, okay, sorry, uh, I digress. Um, so in Leighton Prince, they were okay for firearms. There is one study that they kind of liked, but a number of others that they critiqued, and they said, therefore, there's more work needed here. And shoe prints and bite marks, they did not find any studies that supported the notion that this can be done well. Um, what they really mean by being done well is to do a study where you go back and ask, for example, the same person to look at the same evidence and see whether they draw the same conclusion, which is typically referred to as reproducibility, or ask would different analysts given the same evidence draw the same conclusion, often thought of as a measure of reliability. Um, and then finally, some studies of accuracy, that is where you know the answer, you can judge how well the experts doing the analysis can do on it. And I mentioned they found fingerprints compelling. One of the most best known studies is the black box study that was done by uh, some FBI examiners in concert with uh, Noblis, a, a, a consulting company. Um, and they did a study that found a false positive rate of about one in a thousand. That is, an identification was declared when in fact there was no identification, that they, they were not matching fingerprints. Um, and one of the interesting findings that I think even the discipline found interesting was the large false negative rate. So these are cases where there were matching prints, but the examiner ruled them as a non-match. So, so with all of that as background, um, the subject that I want to emphasize today and talk about um, you know, for the next half hour or so are likelihood ratios. Uh, the likelihood ratio has come up as, quote unquote, the logical way of evaluating and interpreting for forensic evidence. Sorry about the typos. Um, there's a lot, been a lot of attention to it all over. Um, Europe has moved fairly decisively in this direction, at least in terms of saying that this is the right thing to do. Uh, NC, which is a European network of forensic science institutes, so a set of 15-ish or so uh, national forensic institutes got together and agreed, and they produced a document that's interesting and nice to read, which basically says this is the way it should be done. Uh, the document acknowledges that the quantitative methods required do not yet exist in a number of the disciplines, um, but they still come out strongly in favor of doing likelihood ratios, um, and maybe say a little bit more about their thoughts on it later. Uh, it is important to recognize um, one of my flaws sometimes, I don't uh, make it clear. The likelihood ratio is not the answer to every question in forensics. Um, it, there are places where it does not apply at all or well, at least um, in terms of when the determination is time of death or to reconstruct a crime scene, which is done, for example, in blood pattern analysis, um, or in determining whether a fire was an arson or not. You can imagine ways to apply likelihood ratio thinking in each of those settings, but um, that's not necessarily the best way to do it. So I'm really gonna focus on, as PCAST did, the disciplines where comparisons are being made and where the likelihood ratio is a plausible approach. So my plan is to talk about the likely ratio in general, um, how it looks or might look in different forensic disciplines. In many ways, there's a yes, we can do it in DNA, 
uh, we may be able to do this in glass, we probably can, and pattern evidence is gonna be really hard. Um, because of that last statement, there's been increasing attention on what's sometimes called score-based likelihood ratios. So I'll end up there, and in some ways, that's the genesis of this presentation is, um, in some of our conversations, there was a sense of, you know, what, what do we, people mean when they talk about score-based likelihood ratios? What are the, some of the issues involved in using them? And so that's where I'll end up. So the likelihood ratio, um, in very broad overview terms, uh, we think about the evidence E, and I'll say a little bit more about that, but for now it's just a placeholder for whatever you can measure, um, and two hypotheses. What are typically labeled H sub P, the prosecution proposition or hypothesis, which is that the two samples have the same source, and the defense proposition, that the two samples have different sources. Um, these can be refined. These may be very different in different cases. That is, the defense may have a specific alternative. It was not my client. It was so-and-so, uh, or just it was not my client. And those might have different implications for how you evaluate the defense hypothesis. Um, the Bayes theorem tells us in a setting like this, uh, that you can use the expression, the formula here to relate, to obtain the posterior probabilities or the posterior odds, relative probabilities or odds of these two propositions uh, by starting with your a priori odds before you look at the evidence. And then the likelihood ratio is the piece in the middle here. So the likelihood ratio, sometimes known as the Bayes factor, and I'll say a little bit more about those two terms, um, shows up in this theorem as the information that the evidence conveys about the relative likelihood of the two hypotheses. Uh, so the numerator says, how likely is the evidence if the prosecution's hypothesis is true? If this suspect was in fact the person who committed the crime, how likely is it that I would see two fingerprints that match this closely, or two shoe prints that match this closely, or two DNA profiles that match? Uh, the denominator asks, how likely is the evidence if the defense hypothesis is true? And so in some way, shape, or form, the defense, the, the denominator is trying to get at, could this be a coincidence? Could this be a random match of some kind? Uh, one positive step that thinking about the likely ratio does and has actually done is, in my observation, the forensic community is now paying much more attention to the explicit requirement that they think about the evidence under these two propositions. Uh, you can imagine a, a process in which you kind of just thought about the numerator and said, you know, how likely is it that I get this evidence? And as you, as that number goes up, as you say, wow, you know, these match and I'm, you know, to become more convinced, but you can't really make the posterior judgment that you need to make without considering both. So that's, to my mind, one of the real positives. Um, something that I'm not going to discuss after this slide, but which is really, really important is there is a lot of evidence that the likelihood ratio is confusing to people, um, that they don't get it. Um, there are some common misconceptions where people will take some of these conditional probabilities, um, like the numerator, and flip those and think about the number that they're looking at as talking, speaking to the probability of the proposition given the evidence, when in fact it's talking about the probability of the evidence given the proposition. So um, that's one well-known uh, fallacy or, or misinterpretation. But even more generally, um, if you look at how this is supposed to work, one way that you can think about Bayes' theorem is working in the courtroom is there is someone who has to make a decision, sometimes called the trier of fact. And so they are the person who has this prior hypothesis, perhaps. And then a forensic examiner comes in and gives this evidence. And so they provide the middle term and enables the trier of fact to update their hypotheses when they believe the evidence. Um, this itself is somewhat controversial. There, uh, some of the folks at NIST, including some of the folks on the call, um, you know, are concerned about having different people in different places in this chain, right? The trier of fact has a prior 
should the trier of fact have a likelihood ratio or should the examiner have a likelihood ratio? Um, I'm not going to talk about that much more. But experiments done, including by uh, Bill Thompson here at UC Irvine, have shown that when you give people cases and ask them to make judgments and then introduce the likelihood ratio and ask them to update their judgments, they don't always update in a consistent way. Uh, probably more correct to say they don't often update uh, in a consistent way. Um, and this, he's tried a number of different ways of explaining the likelihood ratio because, you know, reading it may, may not be sufficient. So, so that's going to be a real challenge even if we succeed. Um, some, of what, some of what I'm going to show you is it's not so easy to do, but even if we were able to do and get the likelihood ratio, there is this challenge of how we convey it. Uh, I'm going to keep things relatively simple, but it's worth talking briefly about what's really in the likely ratio, which is more information than just evidence given hypotheses. Often the likely ratio depends on some set of parameters. These could be similar in the two hypotheses or different, so I've labeled them differently here. Those are thetas. Uh, if you think about DNA, which is the first case I'll talk about, the thetas are allele frequencies. You need to know that to assess the probability of seeing this evidence under either hypothesis. Uh, so having allele frequencies is relevant. Uh, and I put an I here for other information. I think of two different kinds of things here, and arguably they should have been listed differently in this expression. Um, one is there is often information involved in the forensic exam that an examiner may need to know. Uh, for example, where the latent print came from. Did it come from blood? Did it come from a glass? Or, you know, I am not an expert. I don't know that they need to know that, but you can imagine that there are instances in which you'd like to know that. Uh, so task relevant information. Uh, the second piece is there's some data that is used to estimate these parameters. And you could argue that there should be a D somewhere in this likelihood ratio, but I didn't put it there in part because it's not immediately clear and whether you want it with the E or with the hypothesis. Um, in many ways, it belongs with the E, uh, but that complicates the modeling in a way that I don't want to do today. So I just want to put this out there to make sure that, you know, the, these facts are not lost. Uh, a teeny bit more in terminology before I move to some of the pattern disciplines. Um, the first comment in here is um, just a general one, which is there seems to be a lot of confusion about likely ratios and the Bayesian approach. Um, I've hit that. I'm on a committee uh, with practitioners um, as part of the OSAC, uh, the NIST Organized Organization of Scientific Area Committees that is trying to standardize practice. Um, and as we talk about con stating conclusions, for example, the question comes up about likely ratios. And I had one examiner with great frustration say, I don't get this, you're telling me likely ratios, I have people on my subcommittee telling me I should do Bayes, you know, what's the difference, what's the same? So a lot of confusion and, you know, it's easy to understand why, right? Because we call this the Bayesian approach, Bayes theorem, and in the middle of it is something that we think of as a likelihood ratio. So the likelihood ratio is, in this instance, a Bayesian idea. However, likely ratios are all over statistics, and they're not always a Bayesian idea. In fact, when we teach our graduate students in statistics how to test hypotheses, we teach them the likely ratio approach as a non-Bayesian approach. So there is some room for confusion here. Um, uh, to my mind, um, the likely ratio in this context is being used in a Bayesian context. And then the confusion tends to mount because there are two terms that are used for this ratio, the base factor and the likelihood ratio. And there's some ambiguity in how they're used, although I think most people have kind of a consensus that the distinction between think about these parameters, these nuisance parameters, the thetas here. And so in a likelihood ratio, uh, it didn't come out very well, um, but you estimate theta P and theta D somehow um, from the data that you have available. And in the base factor, you average over uncertainty. So rather than try to guess a single value, you consider all plausible values and use them to weight up your probabilities. Um, so this is, again, not something I'm going to be talking about, again, a lot in the literature now about 
likely ratios and base factors and how they're estimated and the like. Uh, I'm going to be somewhat agnostic in what follows. Um, sometimes I'll be thinking of it as a likely ratio, and sometimes I'll be thinking of it as a base factor. So, as I said, I'd like to run through kind of four, if you will, topics. Uh, three examples, DNA, glass, and pattern evidence broadly, and then talk about score-based likelihood ratios, which are relevant for pattern. Uh, people may have seen the DNA version of this. I'm not going to do a lot of notation or detail in any of it, um, but almost none here. So the notion is uh, a DNA profile is there are a set of locations along the genome. That's this table in blue. Uh, each location along the genome is known as a marker. Um, and if you look at the third marker down, THO1, uh, for an individual, they will have two alleles there. These are count one from your mother and one from your father. So this person, this profile has a seven and a nine. Uh, I won't get into what those numbers are, but they have some meaning. And there are, for each marker, a set of known alleles that come up. So the setting is we have a sample from a suspect from the crime scene, and it's kind of key for reasons that I mentioned earlier that we think about it as we're pretty confident this came from one source and one source only. The more complicated the sample, the more people who may have contributed, the harder the statistics is. So we, get a, we have a suspect now, and we get a DNA sample from the suspect. And now the evidence is those two DNA profiles. Um, if they don't match, we're not really particularly interested in the case because the likelihood of getting non-matching profiles is very, very small if the person did the crime. Um, and so, I don't know if I said that right, but so for the moment, assume we see two matching profiles. Then the likelihood ratio asks us to calculate in the numerator the probability of observing these two matching profiles if, in fact, the two DNA samples have the same source. And the denominator asks us to calculate the probability of observing these two matching profiles if they have different sources. And it's relatively easy to argue that the likely ratio, again, some simplification here, is one in the numerator, since if this person did it, the profiles will match up to some minor mutation error rates and things like that. And the denominator is the quantity of interest, which is how likely is it that a the match is happening by coincidence. So this person did not leave the sample, but happens to match on all of these markers. So you can calculate that from data about the allele frequencies. And so I mentioned THO1 uh, because on this, this slide, I have the possible alleles that one can have, uh, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 9.3, 10, and 11, and how frequent they are. And the laws of genetics tell us how to calculate the probability that a randomly chosen person from this distribution will have a 7 and a 9. Um, the genetics allows for a factor of 2 because you could have gotten the 7 from your mother or your father and the 9 from the other parent. Um, and you can see that this probability is, these are fairly common alleles but the probability of matching on those two alleles is still pretty small. And the likelihood ratio based on this single marker is 15.6. And the markers are plausibly independent. Um, and so you can compute one for each marker and multiply them, and you can see how DNA evidence become, ends up yielding very large likelihood ratios, billions, hundreds of billions to one um, in the likelihood ratio. So, this is done a lot, likely DNA is very powerful evidence in part because the likelihood ratio works. There's a non-controversial quantification of the strength of the evidence. So often referred to as the gold standard, and I mentioned that here primarily so you can see what the features are that we would like to see. That is the mechanism, the biology is well understood, the probability model that tells you how you get your alleles is well understood. There are population data available, um, and this has been peer reviewed. So that's kind of why DNA is called the gold standard. Uh, it's worth mentioning that as good as it is, there are still issues in DNA evidence. So uh, one issue is the fact that different subpopulations, different ethnic groups have different frequencies, and so there's a question about you know, how big a database do you need to have the right allele frequencies? Um, 
Bill Thompson has given a presentation at UC Irvine where he showed how actually deciding what alleles are present in a DNA profile um, has subjective elements to it and shows some examples where contextual information from the case impacts what alleles the expert decides they see in the, um, in the profile. Uh, a couple of other issues, as I mentioned, or PCAS addressed in great detail. If the sample contains lots of mixtures, that's the probability models for that are not as well determined. There's a number of different software programs. Uh, studies have been done where the same mixture was sent to a bunch of different labs and they get wildly different answers. And that's why PCAS said, we're not so good at mixtures. Uh, the other interesting thing about DNA is as our tech ability to profile DNA from small amounts of material has improved, uh, we now have strange instances of contamination. That is, I might touch something in my house and then, you know, a week, even two weeks later, someone might come in and commit a crime with that item and my DNA could still be found on it. Even though the other person held it for a long period of time to last up, my DNA might be identified. So those kinds of things are happening. So, so still issues, but DNA is the best example I have of how the likely ratio works. Uh, the second example I want to talk about is how it, you could see how it might work and does in fact work for trace evidence, um, but you'll see some of the issues that arise. So trace evidence refers to a set of different kinds of evidence where a trace is left at the crime scene. So I'll be talking about glass. Uh, Alicia and I did this bullet lead study a long time ago. That's another example of trace evidence. Um, and there are many others. Hair and fiber are considered trace evidence. Um, Likely ratios are most relevant when you can measure some characteristic of the item. In this case, you can measure chemical concentrations of glass, or the data I'll show is refractive index. That is how uh, much light slows down when it goes through glass. Uh, it turns out to be a reliable characteristic that you can measure over and over. Uh, so is it possible to do likely ratios here? Well, the argument for why it might be possible is um, illustrated with the data I have here. The picture on the left shows refractive index measurements for a large population of glass fragments, more than 2,000. Um, and so there's a lot of variability across the population. Notice the, for glass, the indexes are in a pretty narrow range, 1.50 to 1.54 or so for this type of glass. Um, but Within that narrow range, um, there's a fair bit of variation. So some potential for a feature that you could use to distinguish. That's what the left says. Uh, that by itself is not so helpful, um, but the picture on the right shows within a particular piece of glass, these are multiple fragments, and the horizontal axis is much, much smaller now. So it kind of says repeated fragments from one sheet of glass, will be very closely clustered around that glass's core value of refractive index. But the picture on the left says other pieces of glass are likely to have very different, or not very different, but different. So, so this suggests this is possible, is all that I want to put that forward for. Uh, the second picture is uh, a throwback for Alicia. Um, this is, uh, we worked with bullet lead and the FBI, um, and they provided data, which is 200 bullets from each of four manufacturers. The manufacturers are color-coded here, um, and there are measurements of five trace elements. Bullets are mostly lead. In the making of bullets, some trace elements are added, copper, silver, antimony, so on and so forth. Um, and these are displays of the data, and so that you see that A, Different manufacturers have very different profiles in the bottom picture. Um, and in the top two pictures, you see that even within a manufacturer, there are kind of clusters of bullets. Um, I'm not going to talk about this. Uh, the work that we did was uh, suggested likely ratios would not be terribly informative in bullet lead. That was followed by a National Academy of Science study reaching a similar conclusion, which was followed by the FBI no longer using bullet lead, lead compositional analysis of bullet lead as a forensic technique. 
So that's why I won't talk about it anymore. But again, it's, an, it's similar to the glass and how the analysis might go. Uh, I know folks in the FBI have recently looked at copper wire, which is used in explosives, um, to see if they could do this kind of analysis there as well. So how would a likelihood ratio work for trace evidence? Uh, in this case, we need the, the tools that we talked about liking in the DNA case. Uh, we need probability models to describe how the data comes into being, um, and we also need to be able to figure out something about this population distribution. Um, so I've given a couple of references on this slide, um, but wanted to talk through a little bit about how it might work. Uh, these are the most formula kind of driven slides, but um, they're just, the formulas are just placeholders for me to talk through. So suppose that we have X measurements from glass fragments at the crime scene and Y measurements from fragments on the suspect. You need two different things to do to be able to build a likely ratio. On the one hand, you need some kind of probability model that describes the variation of measurements taken from a single piece of glass. And so I've called that distribution F here. Um, and a draw from F, a sample from F, is the picture on the left here. Uh, I apologize for switching left and right. But, um, within comes first in the slide. Um, so the within, you tend not to have as much data. In this case, there's 50 measurements from fragments of a single sheet of broken glass. Um, and, you know, it looks unimodal, normal, maybe long tail. These things tend to have long tails. Um, so that's the F distribution. Um, and a priori, we have these two samples. We don't know if they come from the same window or not. So they each have their own mean theta. And then there's some amount of variability that characterizes this distribution, which I've labeled V with a little W for variance within a piece of glass. Uh, the second piece that you need to assess the likelihood of a coincidental match um, is variation um, between samples. And so that's the histogram on the right, and that I've called governed by distribution G. And so G is basically picking pieces of glass. It's a stop dictation. Sorry? Sorry? Um, G is, um, yeah, oh, sorry, go ahead, question. No question. All right, I will continue. Um, the variation between samples basically describes how different sheets of glass come into being, if you will, and there's some mean that describes that population and some variance VB, which is the variance between. Now, in fact, that distribution G looks to be somewhat complex, so I'm kind of giving a simple version of it here. And the likely ratio says I should look at the evidence, X and Y, those measurements, under the two hypotheses, the prosecutor's hypothesis and the defense hypothesis. In this case, I've left some of these major parameters as known, acting as if they're known for now. Um, if so, the numerator says, how likely am I to see X and Y if these both sets of fragments came from the same sheet of glass? And so the thing that happens in this case is that both the X measurements and the Y measurements come from the same mean, because they came from the same piece of glass. And then I don't know what that mean is, so I have to average over the population distribution. I was gonna keep pointing, but I lost my cursor. Um, so that's the numerator. And in this case, the denominator is different because in the denominator, X and Y come from different windows. So they each have their own mean, and they each need to be averaged over the population distribution of glass. So again, I'm not actually gonna do this. Um, I just wanna show you how it might work and point out some of the issues that come up. And so the key issues that come up are, what I just described can and has been done. The Lucy and Aiken paper I referred to shows you a number of ways for estimating those distributions and computes likely ratios for a few examples. Um, but a key thing is the likely ratio can be very sensitive to the distributional assumptions you make. Uh, there's an F distribution within a piece of glass, 
and then there's this population distribution. And some recent work at NIST has shown exactly how wide the likely ratio range can be, and it's, it's pretty extreme. Um, the second challenge in this case is figuring out what the population really ought to be, which could be case context. In, right, um, the folks in Irvine uh, faculty all live in a faculty ghetto up the hill here. Um, all the houses built presumably with very similar glass, et cetera, et cetera. So, you know, it's quite plausible that everyone's walking around with fragments from this kind of type of glass. And, you know, does that imply, you know, how does that impact this analysis? So, for trace evidence, you begin to see how the mathematics of it might work, although there are still some serious questions. Um, Okay, as I look at the time, and I want to leave time for questions, I'll talk very briefly about pattern evidence and then score-based likelihoods. So pattern evidence, as we said earlier, you have shoe prints, you have fingerprints, you have um, firearms, uh, question documents are usually included, um, and you want to assess whether they're the same or not. Well, Pattern evidence, likely ratios for pattern evidence is going to be very challenging for a variety of reasons. The data is basically the image. So it's not the measurements of the glass, the image, which is very high dimensional and contains lots of information, not all of which is necessarily useful. So um, that leads to the second point, which is there's a lot of flexibility in figuring out what features in the image to focus on. And then we need probability models if we're going to build a likely ratio for those features and how frequently they occur, both in real matches and non-matches. Um, and again, you have this population question. So whenever I talk about likely ratios for pattern evidence, I'm reminded of one of my favorite Sidney Harris cartoons, um, which is, uh, you know, I think you should be more explicit in step two, um, uh, where it says, then a miracle occurs. Um, there is, is very challenging. There's interesting work happening. Um, there's a, uh, some work of Cedric Newman and Christophe Champeau and others. Um, and in a very sketch, sketch term, in very sketchy terms, here's what they do. Um, it still requires an examiner to mark up the latent print and identify some of the features where ridges end or, or come together. Um, these are marked with an indicator of what kind of feature and the orientation, which are the little uh, fish or tails. Um, and then a set of them, six, are triangulated. That is, the center is identified, the black dot. Triangles are, are built between every two minutia and the center. Um, and characteristics of that triangle are calculated. So each minutia is characterized by the shape of its triangle, associated triangle, the direction or angle that the minutia sits at and the type of minutia. And Newman and colleagues have developed likelihood ratios for each of these, although it's very challenging because to get the numerator likely ratio for these components, you need to know how much variation you would expect to see in repeated prints from the same finger. And there is not much data about that. Um, people have to actually do experiments and ask people to distort their finger to get it. Um, and so there's some, but not much. And so there are distortion models that, for example, Newman et al. use. The denominator requires knowing how likely it is to find matching features in prints from different fingers, that is. Um, and in this, they've, what they've done and what people do in many of the pattern disciplines is try to find, use a database search to find the nearest non-match using automatic image analysis um, and look at the distribution of distances between features that they find there for the denominator. So they've been able to do this, um, get some likely ratios, but again, some unhappiness so last piece from me, given the difficulty of doing this in pattern data with real probability models, there's been a lot of focus on so-called score-based likelihood ratios. What I have drawn here is a conceptual picture totally made up. If you had samples of evidence where you know that the samples match and you have a mechanism for assigning a score to a pair of items, how close they are, or how far apart they are, in this case, uh, how far apart they are, um, then you could look at the distribution of scores in the known non-matches, and they wouldn't be far apart at all, so they'd be on the left of this histogram. And you could look at the scores for non-matches, and they'd be far apart. And so you'd have these two different distributions. You might be able to fit a density to them and use that to get your likely ratio. 
So uh, a few slides that show you that this is actually very, this is a very popular approach right now. Um, this comes from some work at Iowa State, uh, the group there that has been looking at uh, bullets um, and the grooves in a bullet. As a bullet gets fired, there are grooves on its surface. There, you can take 3D images um, and they have these signatures, top left, two signatures from what are called bullet lands. I don't really have time to go into too much detail. They came up with an approach to align these as best as can be done. And then from these aligned signatures, they came up with a number of measures. How many consecutive peaks appear to be lined up and agree? How many consecutive peaks where it doesn't match? So each of these is a potential score. And then you see here seven different scores that could be computed for these two images. For the B in, from the two signatures in the B image, and some are better at distinguishing known matches from non-matches than others. Uh, the exciting part of what's been happening at Iowa State is they found if you put these together, you get very good discrimination, even though no single one does the discrimination. But as I say, this is happening in lots of places. So these are bullet um, lands. Uh, these are bullet faces. There's a group at NIST that's come up with an approach to decide whether uh, when, you, when you shoot a gun, the hammer hits the back of the casing and leaves marks, consistent marks. Um, and so the comparison is done between a bullet at the crime scene and a bullet where it obtained from a test fire of the suspect's gun and the desire to see whether those two match. Um, I don't wanna to say too much. They have an approach here where they count the number, uh, they break the image up into small squares and count the number of matching squares across the two images. And you can see here, the known matches in yellow on the right have lots and lots of matching squares. And the known non-matches very rarely have matching squares. And if they do, only one or two or three. So there appears to be great separation here. Um, so these are being done in a lot of places, but for me at least, there's a very significant challenge. Uh, you have two distributions. The known match distribution seems to work reasonably well. My questions come up on the non-match distribution. Right? In, there's an open question whether the non-match distribution is a single distribution for all non-matches or whether it should be case specific and take features of that case into account. Um, and as an example, to kind of prime this question, um, Karen Kaffadar in Virginia, at Virginia and I visited the Defense Forensic Science Center in Georgia at their request to help assess a measure they were developing, a score they were developing for latent prints. Um, I can't tell you about their method because it's proprietary and I signed a non-disclosure. Um, but um, what I'm about to show you is a slide that showed how it was applied. Um, and this is from a public presentation, so I feel pretty comfortable showing you this slide. Um, what you have here are distrib distributions like the ones I've been showing you, except stratified by the number of minutia in the latent print. So the first bar on the left is latent print has five minutia. And there were a number of cases where experimentation was done, known matches, but working from only five minutia and no non-matches working from only five minutiae in the latent print. And you can see at the top in the blue, and the colors don't match very well. They look a little better than they did last night. I got closer. Um, that is, the picture came from Henry Swafford at the Defense Forensic Science Center's slide, and I needed to build the match, non-match box. Um, the non-match distribution, um, pretty similar across the number of minutiae for this score, although the tail, going down, the black tail, is obviously a little longer for when there's fewer minutia. So sometimes the fewer minutia does not provide as much information. But the part that I've been intrigued by is the non-matches. Um, and the non-matches seem to vary, to my mind, a little bit more as the number of minutia increase. Um, and so this would have an impact, right? The, the question really is about the overlap of these two distributions. And I don't know the answer to the question. I only ask the question is, you, you know, the way that most people propose to do this is, we'll do a million comparisons and we'll get a bunch of non-matches, we'll have that distribution. And then when we do our comparison, we'll be able to say, 
this comparison looks a lot like the known match distribution. It's in the middle of the known match distribution. Or, uh, but we have only seen scores this high 1% or 3% or 5% of the time in our non-match distribution. But I think it's an open question whether that's what should be done or whether we need to break by case-specific information, as I've done here. And I'm not a fingerprint examiner, so this was an obvious thing for me to stratify on. Maybe there are other things that should be stratified on, the physical size of the latent print, the substrate that it was left in. I don't know the answer. So um, as a summary, um, likely ratios are, depending on who you ask, a logical way or the logical way to evaluate and summarize forensic evidence. But what I've tried to show today is there are challenges. Um, in a, in a lot of different ways. Score based likely ratios are easier to develop, and so that's where a lot of work is happening, but they come with their own challenges. Um, I have 158 Pacific time, so I did not leave a lot of time, but there are a couple of minutes for questions if people have questions. Thank you. In case you can't hear, that was raucous applause here. No. Okay. Uh, this is questions. FIU. Make sure that you uh, um, stop sharing so we can see video of the uh, person asking the question. Sure. Qu any questions or comments? Let's see, Hal, can you hear? Yes. Hi, this is Austin. I think one of the things on the, um, the feature-based things, um, and I'm most familiar with the fingerprint ones, is they're very dependent on examiner markup of features. And there's extensive inter-examiner variation in how features are marked up. And so one of the headaches in that is that even if you're dealing with the same evidence, you're also dealing with the you know variation in examiners on what they consider constitutes a minutia, what they see in the image, et cetera. Uh, great point, and you know, you guys have been doing the work to kind of quantify that variation, um, which I think is really great, and which PCAST has also kind of called out as worthy of emulation. Um, you know, you and I have talked a fair bit about this. Um, that is definitely a challenge, and I think one of the questions is really whether more automated feature detection is going to become a part of this uh, in order to make it more plausibly uh, applicable. I have a question, Hal. Uh, this is Jared Nimi at Iowa State. Can you hear me just fine? Yes, I can hear you. Okay. Um, so you showed the likelihood ratio of the phase factor being used in the context of uh, DNA. And yes. That was relatively uncontroversial. But the part that seems somewhat controversial to me is the selection of the population. Um, and it seems like what would make sense is for the defense to get to select the population that you're comparing against. Um, and so I guess my question really is a practical matter, you know, how would that actually play out in terms of the selection of what population you're looking at for the baseline rate of uh, the alleles, as well as really the multivariate distribution of, of how those alleles work? Um, it's a good question, and it's not my area of strength. But what happens is there are, you know, so the FBI maintains the CODIS kind of database, which, uh, and so there are a set of markers and a population that they have access to. So the question in you know, your hypothesis that the, or your suggestion that the defense um, you know, be able to choose the database, it, it, the defense choice really comes into what um, hypothesis they want to put forth as the competing hypothesis, right? So it wouldn't necessarily be a different database so much as to say, you know, we think it was, you know, it wasn't him, but it was his twin, and we have reasons to believe that. What happens then? That kind of thing. Um, yeah, I guess my question is that uh, within a certain population, the frequency of the alleles might be much different than within the general population. And, and so the defense might say, well, you know, we'll concede that it's, you know, somebody of this heritage or something. Right. Right. And, and that's what's done is, you know, and by ethnic groups, for example, you're exactly right. They differ and there's some degree of data. And one of the things that happens, of course, is there's less data, so a little bit more uncertainty. But so absolutely. Okay. Thanks. Um, 
Joanne Buscalia, who's listening, um, but doesn't have a microphone, wanted to mention that on the glass examples, you have to consider the variation within a single fragment. That is, there are multiple measurements from a single fragment, as you don't necessarily get all the fragments from the same source. So that would make the light. Correct. Thank you, Joanne. Uh, Daniel Attinger from CSAFE. Uh, I, I have a question that is maybe outside of your area of expertise. Uh, thanks for presenting this uh, PCAST uh, publication that I didn't know uh, about. I was wondering if you know uh, how the selection of the disciplines was made. Did they choose the, the one that had the best scientific reputation or? Uh, I, I think someone else may know more, but my impression is they were um, somewhat ad hoc, but among the well-known, the most well-known well and widely utilized and or where there was controversy. The one that I didn't talk about was hair. Um, and they, they addressed hair as well, in part because there was some ongoing review of cases that had some information. So, um, you know, I, I think they were governed by, you know, where the action was. All right, thank you. And, and I have another very naive question. Uh, the, the likelihood ratio, at least in the, the example that you, you showed where we had a likelihood ratio of 15, to, to me, it, it looks like it, it simply, um, but pardon my, my naivety, it's it simply uh, the inverse of the probability. And, and uh, is it something to, to make it, uh, uh, b because we believe the jury is too stupid to deal with number smaller than one, or, or what, what's the... Yes. No, it, it's a good question. And as I said, the likely ratio is not necessarily helpful in, uh, in conveying this stuff. Um, the the, and in, for DNA, there is some, at least I think historically, and maybe still people testify with the denominator, the quote unquote random match probability. That is the likelihood of finding someone like this is one in a billion, therefore. Right. So um, the only comment I would make is I start with DNA in part because it's, you know, so straightforward and the numerator is essentially one. Um, in the trace evidence, neither the numerator nor the denominator is particularly easy or even intuitive. It's only the ratio that has the meaning. So um, when there is a discrete characteristic, for example, happens with blood type two or, you know, then you're exactly right. You can really focus only on that probability. Thank you. Hi, this is uh, Simone. Can you hear me? Yes. Hello? Yes, I can hear you, Simone. I, hear how to. Uh, I was just wondering, for the glass example, I really liked on your slide the way you mentioned the hypotheses in the sense of whether the guy broke the window or not. Do you have anything to say on all the research that's been done on activity level propositions to actually address the propositions of interest to the court, which are not necessarily source level, but are usually, or most, most of the cases, at activity level, which is the question of whether a particular person, for example, the person of interest, broke the window? Uh, great question, um, and as I said at the start today, none of these are particularly my areas of expertise. Um, I, you know, I at another time can talk about what I'm working on at the moment, but um, in the glass case, there's a piece that I totally left out of the likelihood ratio, um, and given Joanne's comment, obviously more than one piece that I've left out. There's, you know, vari variation among the fragments themselves, but there's also questions of transfer, which would uh, be relevant to the question you're asking, which is, you know, how likely is it that you would have certain amount of fragments on you just by being in the neighborhood versus by being the person who did it? Um, I don't really have much more to say than that. Um, it's a very good question. And I'm not well versed yes. in that part of the literature. Thank you. Yep. And may I also add a comment? Sure. So please, um, I think Harry and Steve are online. They can correct me, but I believe that the data they analyzed in their article was fictive. So it was made up data regarding on the refractive index data they analyzed. So I just wanted to put that out there, that it wasn't based on real data. It's a fictive case that they analyzed. <laughs>
Yeah, I'm thank not. You. Yeah, thank you. Hal, I don't know if you can hear me. It's Mark Pollitt. Yes. Um, I, I just want to uh, make a comment and, and kind of reinforce what you started with uh, for the benefit of some of the other folks. I think it's important to understand that likelihood ratio is, is uh, in a lot of the statistical methods are most useful for the identification questions and or the classification questions. Uh, you know, there are lots of different kinds of forensic questions, uh, reconstruction and that sort of thing, which these don't work for. And I think that goes to the comment about the activity versus the identification part. And I think I just wanted to point that out so that uh, as the, the folks at CCA for thinking about these things as they go forward, that, uh, you know, we realize that we're only, uh, we're, we're going to need to look at methods for each of the different kinds of forensic questions. Yes, thank you. We, we have a pretty uh, specified remit in our agreement with NIST in terms of focusing, and, and you know this, Mark, on pattern evidence and digital evidence. So, so, so who broke the glass is, is not in our interest in, in, in our wheelhouse at the moment. Well, yeah, but it's going to be a, a major issue in, in digital because digital answers virtually all of the, the forensic yes. questions. I have oh, go ahead. Uh, this is Jay. A um, uh, question for you: Does in the um, in the score-based likelihoods, does it matter that in general we don't know how the scores are computed? Um, that I mean, not to be careful. What you mean by general? That is so. The one that I showed you, I actually do know how they're computed, um, and um, that person has been very uh, good. Is trying to figure it out, but would like to be more open source about it. Um, it, it is, uh, but your question is extremely pertinent because the scores that are used in database matching um, are not publicly available. Um, I don't have a lot of experience working with um, the, the so-called IAFIS or IAFIS um, data, that is what comes out of those systems. I know the folks at NIST do a great deal with it. It is something um, I think CSAFE through Karen Cafedar is gonna be looking a little bit more closely at. Um, so I would say that is a concern of mine. Um, I've not looked at the data. Um, and it's obviously hard to interpret, um, but I don't know what's coming out right now. My understanding is as the software evolves, the scores that are coming out are simultaneously serving as scores in the sense that I mean them, some measure of distance, if you will, um, and will already come out with some measure of uniqueness included. So those two things would be, you know, are already are being done together, as I understand it. Austin Hicklin knows more and others, but um, probably don't want to go too far down there. But so, so I, I agree that that's an important question. Um, and my thinking about this is, and the examples I gave are focused on places where the scores and the methods are known. Hal, this is Leslie Hammer. Can you hear me? Yes. How are you? Thank you for this. So very interesting. I'm, I'm wondering with the score based, when you talk about matches and non-matches, if you're talking about ground truth matches or if you're talking about forensically responsible matches, does that question make sense? Oh, yes, absolutely. They are ideally um, ground truth known matches. And I think in each of the three examples, they are. Um, there is a question about how to do that more broadly um, as we try to build large databases. Uh, it's not so obvious where a large database of ground truth might come from that gets marked up, for example, in a latent print analysis. Um, I mentioned briefly the studies that Henry Swafford has done. He basically had people kind of distort their own print um, and then those were full prints, and so then he made latent prints by kind of chopping off pieces of it. Um, and so he knew which were the same, and then he presumes when he pulls something out of a database um, that it doesn't match any of these people, and he made a pretty compelling case to me that it 
was incredibly unlikely that his non-matches were polluted. Um, so great question. This, this gets a lot more complicated when we're talking about footwear because we don't just have IDs and non-IDs. Um, we have you know, various levels of associations. And so I don't know at all how that, I just wondered if you'd given any thought to transferring this to that kind of um, scenario. Well, so there are different parts of the CSAFE group that are looking at shoe prints. Um, we have a, a group here um, led by a computer scientist that's kind of looking at uh, the images that are created and where information may lie and, and things, questions like that. Um, and maybe being trying to build up a database and there's some outside CSAFE activity along those lines too. We have people looking at randomly acquired characteristics as well. So there's some work in that direction, but I think the shoe prints is a challenging world to be sure. Thank you. Yep. There's a question from Joanne in the chat. Yes. Yeah, so Joanne asked, whether our NIST mandate considers trace as pattern evidence. Can we work on glass? Um, we don't have any plans right now to do that. Um, I don't think it does. We could ask, probably best not to ask on this seminar. <laughs> Other questions? Well, thank you everyone for participating. Um, Alicia, do you want to finish us off or should I uh, say goodnight, Gracie? She's <laughs> coming up to the microphone. Hold on, Hold on I'm, uh, I'm here. So thank you everybody for participating. Hello, it was a great seminar. Uh, we need to do this more often. <laughs> 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 um, I believe the slides are going, did we ask you whether we could uh, film you? Uh, yeah, I think so. And I, I sent the slides already and... Um... Okay, because we did film you. Okay. <laughs> so I think we're going to have this available on the CSAFE website, um, www.forensicstats.org, um, together with the slides. And so if you think that there's anybody out there who might be interested, go ahead and send them the website. Um, we'd love to hear comments. Uh, so if you have any insights to send um, so that we can improve the way we do things, please let us know uh, how this went. You know, if you have good comments, if you have bad comments, we'll take them all. Uh, to everybody out there, all our uh, advisors, we saw several of you. NIST uh, colleagues, we saw several of you too. Um, we were delighted that you could join us today, and uh, hopefully we'll see you again on February 10. Bye-bye, everybody. Thanks, Hal. Thanks. Thanks. Nice talk. Thank you. Thank you.